Welcome. This is Dean Waldo from Pacific Lutheran University, uh, Department of Chemistry. This is going to be a short, probably rough draft. Um, I haven't had as much time to prepare this little presentation, so but it's on electrochemistry just as a supplement for the last bit of the physical chemistry class um, coverage. <coughs> you may find this useful uh, for a question or two in the final. Um, I'm actually not sure. Anyway, so this is going to cover chapter 6. Point f section 6.5 through the beginning maybe of 6.8. And here what we're doing is extending the discussion from the beginning of chapter 6, sections 1 to 4, where we're thinking of the idea of reaction coordinates, so to speak, or going from reactants to products, and seeing how that relates to delta G, standard state, and at and away from equilibrium. And one very important class of those applications would be to electrochemistry and electrochemical cells. So let's start out looking at a little bit of these electrochemical cells. So what you see on the screen is an electrochemical cell. Uh, we have electrodes, and those would be on the left. I'm just illustrating that as zinc, and the right is copper. And if they're connected by a wire that is not participating in the reaction but allows electrons to flow, they're going to be flowing from the left to the right side. And typically the way these are drawn is the anode is on the left and the cathode is on the right. These metal uh, electrodes are typically in some sort of electrolyte. That's going to be an, ion an ionic conductor that's going to complete the circuit in that sense. Um, we'll say a little bit more about that later. So there needs to be some way for say charge in this section to be able to move over and access charge in the other part of the cell. There may or may not be a barrier in this middle section. Um, if there is, you can sometimes put a what's called a salt bridge and I'll just illustrate that say in orange here you could, well, maybe orange isn't the best color. How about green? Um, so you could put a gel, often it's an ag agar, uh, agar <laughs> gel with salt in it that has about equal ionic mobility for the cation and anion, so it doesn't create what's called a liquid junction potential due to the electrolyte. Um, sometimes you won't see a salt bridge, and in that case you may actually have an extra liquid junction potential, meaning a voltage difference due to how fast the ions can move, say the cation and the anion, or cations and anions of your electrolyte. Okay. Uh, a few more things about the electrochemical cell. If you run this electrochemical cell in a way that, such that it's not at equilibrium, and it could produce work. You often call that a galvanic cell. In other words, in our discussion of Q and K, so non-equilibrium and equilibrium concentrations, you would be at a non-equilibrium concentration where the reaction would like to proceed to find equilibrium, and so you can use electron movement from that uh, process to drive work or provide work. And again, this is going to be a non-PV work. You could take a system, move that back down, that is, say, close to equilibrium and drive it in the non-spontaneous direction by putting work into the system. So that would be using it as an electrolytic cell. Often you'll see this in terms of electroplating or perhaps recharging a battery. Now thinking a little bit more about the electrochemical cell, we mentioned that the left-hand side is the anode and the right is the cathode. And by definition, in most definitions, anode is where oxidation is going to take place. And that is, uh, if you remember from Gen Chem, at least those who had it with Lytle and myself, we often use the acronym LEO goes GER. So loss of electrons is oxidation, gain of electrons is reduction. So on the left-hand side would be where the loss of electrons takes place, and hence you see the 
um, electrons going up through to the wire uh, coming from the oxidation of the anode. I will show that in, how about, again, green, actually a darker green. So that electron movement would start and go along that wire and go towards the reduction side of the cathode. Then that's where reduction would take place. Those electrons that have been produced would be gained by the reduction component. So as an example, let's just draw what might be an oxidation reduction pair in this case. So two half reactions. I'll draw the oxidation left hand side of, of the anode as this. So we would typically have, say, zinc as a solid in a zero oxidation state. It's going to go to zinc uh, as an aqueous material or an, in its aqueous state as 2 plus, and then we're going to liberate two electrons. And those are the electrons that are lost in that oxidative process. And then, in terms of reduction, the couple, the other half reaction that goes with that is going to be the copper. And so copper will be in solution, you know, say copper sulfite or something like that, copper 2 plus in an aqueous state it'll take those two electrons and then form copper in a zero state as a solid metal on that anode. I'm sorry, on that cathode. So you're going to be removing zinc from one electrode and depositing copper onto another electrode. Now the difference in energy between those two reactions or cell potential is going to tell you the potential difference between what you would measure if you had, a, say, a voltmeter between those two electrodes. Okay. A uh, couple other definitions. So we might describe this overall reaction then as copper 2 plus as an aqueous component plus zinc solid going to zinc 2 plus, that should be a 2, 2 plus aqueous plus copper 0 solid. And note that I'm not showing the anions for clarity here. There has to be anions involved for charge balance. Now you can describe these electrochemical cells by a certain cell notation and a vertical line denotes a separation between phases. Oops. So for instance, if I were to write a series of material or materials down, say, if we had platinum as a solid electro electrode, and it could be separated from a gas, say hydrogen, And that could be in contact with another phase, say hydrochloric acid, in an aqueous state. Each of these vertical lines indicates a boundary between phases. We can then go back up to this cell. And so, for instance, on the left hand side, you would see you've got a zinc electrode and that would be one phase, and the solution or electrolyte around that would be another phase. So you draw zinc with some sort of boundary, that vertical line between there, and you can describe the cell that way. There's one other important distinction. There are two other symbols. You can have a double line. If you have a double vertical line, this indicates a salt bridge. And if you have a dashed vertical line, this indicates that there's just um, an electrochemical cell with a liquid junction 
potential. Now, we haven't, I haven't really discussed that yet, but let's do that now. So a liquid junction potential is the, can be a small potential difference due to differences in ionic mobilities. And if you use a salt bridge, say what I've described earlier, some salt that is highly mobile in, say, a gel or jelly-like material, say an auger or something that's a lot like jello, the salt may be able to move through there quickly, but and then it can cause a charge balance and doesn't create an extra potential difference, which may decrease the potential of the battery. If you just have free movement of the other ions, sometimes ions move at different rates and you can generate an additional voltage besides the oxidative reductive oxidative and reductive uh, voltages involved in the reaction. So it's important to note that. So for instance, in the cell I draw, drew above, one way to describe that cell if we're using a salt bridge would be zinc solid is in contact with say zinc sulfate in the aqueous state and that is in contact with the other cell through a salt bridge, that's the double line, with copper sulfate, also aqueous, in contact, again vertical line between phases, with copper solid in the zero state and zero state. So this then describes the electrochemical cell we saw above if it has a salt bridge. If I had instead used a vertical dashed line, you maybe just have a mixture of uh, zinc sulfate and copper sulfate, sometimes referred to as a Daniel cell, uh, but then that may generate a little bit of the liquid junction potential and you may not actually get the true voltage difference between those energy states of the two half reactions. Okay, so that's a little bit of an introduction to basic cells very quickly and hopefully reasonably understandable since it's pretty much a rough draft today. Now let's move into the more direct connection to um, the thermodynamics we've been talking about. We've seen already in Chapter 5 that the work we can get from a system is going to equal the delta G for that change, and we'll say at T and P constant. So in other words, the work we're going to see is going to be non-PV work. And then in this case, that's going to be electrical work. So electrons going through some sort of resistor in other words, a cell phone and a cell battery, cell phone battery driving the electrons in your cell phone. That non-equilibrium state of your battery is then driving work in your cell phone, for instance. If we were to take the concept then of the DG, we've seen that this was equal to the sum of all the stoichiometric coefficients times the chemical potential of each component, and times d xi. We then saw that this was could be defined as delta the reaction Gibbs energy, delta gr, also times d xi. And we know that then this is equal to the d work, and I'm going to use a subscript e for electrical work. So this is the maximum work that can take place as uh, the reaction goes from reactants to products or vice versa. So it gives us a way to start to think about applying Gibbs free energy to, say, a battery in this sense. So as the Xi proceeds, there's going to be some amount of, say, in our case, electrons that progress at the same time. So in this case, nu is going to represent the number of electrons that are transferred in a given reaction. 
and so the quantity will be essentially the number of electrons that move from the anode whoops anode to cathode I'm not used to this new iPad so in total we can then rewrite this description in terms of the total number of electro or electrons that would transfer as a negative because of the charge on an electron and then the number of electrons that it is getting moved in a given single reaction E is the actual charge value in coulombs we're going to have N subscript A as Avogadro's number and that's going to be times our reaction coordinate essentially these two, E times the Avogadro's number, is Faraday's constant. And we can essentially define F as E times Avogadro's number. So one can rewrite that as D work, electrical work, is going to equal minus V F E. Now, E is the potential difference uh, coming from that reaction. And that's going to be times D Xi, which we know equals delta R G D Xi. And oops, put that away. And we also still remember from beginning or chapter 5 that we have our standard chemical potential or Gibbs free reaction Gibbs free energy description RT natural log of Q and we can take that and put in 4 delta G and if we then we then end up uh, rearranging that equation into the potential difference between these in this reaction is going to be minus delta R G at standard state over the number of electrons transferred and Faraday's constant minus R T over again nu F natural log of Q so this equation we can rewrite slightly, but that's the beginning of what's called the Nernst equation. Um, we're going to rewrite that as E equals E standard state. So we're just going to take the standard state expression with the Faraday's constant and the number of electrons transferred and just give it a new name and minus R T over nu F natural log of Q and so this is what is called the Nernst equation and note that we're still in a non equilibrium status with Q if we let the reaction go to equilibrium and then Q will go to K and E standard state is going to equal RT over nu F natural log of K. So if we are able to measure, well we're able to get a number of things out of this. So if you know Q and you know your uh, standard state electrochemical value, you can calculate the potential difference for a given uh, electrochemical cell or battery if you let that go to equilibrium and measure the standard state value E uh, circle bar that's another way you can measure equilibrium constants okay I think that gets us essentially close to the end of the portion I wanted to cover the only other piece I'd like to mention is just in the beginning of chapter 6.8 on standard electrode potentials
SEP, standard electrode potentials. Uh, often standard electrode potentials are measured with respect to a special electrode called a standard hydrogen electrode. So standard hydrogen electrode. And you'll often see it written as capital S, capital H, capital E. And that's a half cell that consists of a platinum solid wire with hydrogen gas and hydrogen ions in solution. This then is defined as having a standard state of zero and so all other um, systems are measured relative to that. So for instance if you wanted to measure uh, a specific cell or specific case say look at a silver chloride electro electrode in uh, reference to the standard hydrogen electrode you could have a cell something like what follows and I'll just at least describe the cell with our nomenclature we've talked about so uh, we would have say the platinum solid electrode with a phase boundary between the hydrogen and the gas and then another phase boundary between an acid and solution say HCl aqueous that would be in contact with silver chloride as a solid and then if you had a silver solid electrode. Now this would give you a standard potential and you can then apply this electrochemical cell to the Nernst equation and you would end up with the potential difference for this cell equaling the standard potential for the half cell or the the silver silver chloride half cell as say I written like this silver chloride slash silver and with the chloride anion also in there minus RT over F again nu in this case would equal one one electron transfer natural log and if we write in for Q and put it in terms of activities, you'll have the activity of H plus activity of chlorine minus divided by the activity of H2 to the one half power. And you can go on and simplify from here, but hopefully that gives you some idea. We're now basically calling this uh, standard hydrogen electrode zero and using that as our zero point on measuring voltage differences and it allows us to reference everything to that so like the silver silver chloride electrode will be referenced to the platinum electrode. Well that include, concludes this short mini lecture. Thank you folks.